Diversity programs and leadership initiatives, appreciating the past and looking to the future. Remarks by Mark Puente at the 160th ARL membership meeting, convened by Nancy Baker. This afternoon, uh, Mark Puente, who you all know, uh, ARL's Director of Diversity and Leadership, will uh, share some information with you, a review that we've done on the ARL diversity programs, uh, the accomplishments and future goals. Um, for those of you particularly who are new, uh, I might point out that um, ARL's diversity program has been an integral part of um, ARL's agenda since 1990. And uh, But the more formalized programs that most of you are familiar with uh, were established in 1997. That was with the inaugural opening of the uh, uh, Leadership and Career Development Program. And although there are many organizations that do diversity, uh, none have an emphasis on the strategic needs uh, of academic and research libraries as the ARL diversity programs have done. I think you're going to hear from Mark that the impact of the programs has been wide and far-reaching and uh, just as large, complex research libraries tackle all the issues that we've been talking about at this meeting. So ARL's efforts to serve as an exemplary program for the diversity recruitment and leadership development and research and academic libraries, I think, if not uh, for the profession in general. And that's uh, one of our, of course, overriding goals. This afternoon's program is really very timely as the Leadership and uh, uh, excuse me, diversity and leadership committee is going to be looking to the future, and come to you with an important goal for continued success, which I'll talk about uh, uh, a little bit later after Mark's gone through the information that we want to share with you. So here's Mark. Thank you, Nancy. If I forget to forward any slides, please someone shoot off a flare or something. Um, so thanks for not going uh, to Michigan Avenue and buying shoes. I kind of wish I were there doing exactly that. Um, I had hoped to kind of begin today's presentation with uh, some interesting, provocative story, uh, something with an interesting, maybe uh, you know, some intrigue in there, but of course with that unexpected, funny punchline. In other words, something right out of Jim Neal's playbook um, from that school of oratory and declamation, or maybe it's the Jimmy Neal School of Oratory and Declamation, I'm not certain, but anyway, it's a real place. Um, but alas, my creative juices just weren't working today, uh, but I would, however, like to begin my presentation just with a small personal story, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I hope many, if not all of you, know by now that prior to my life as uh, an academic librarian, as a music librarian, uh, I lived in San Antonio, Texas. I was raised there. I lived most of my childhood and much of my adult life there. San Antonio is a tremendous tremendously colorful city in every respect. It's extremely diverse, uh, very rich food, high content, high fat content food, uh, uh, but it's also highly integrated with respect to the racial and ethnic communities uh, that live and thrive there. Um, it was first reported in 1990 uh, that the Latino and Hispanic population of San Antonio for the first time surpassed the percentage of those in the population who identified as, as white or Caucasian, whatever classification you prefer. Um, but, you know, just much earlier than that, during my childhood, it was really quite clear then that the majority population was, was really reaching out and integrating and, in fact, adopting a lot of the traditions of the Latino community. Um, it was not unusual, for example, for me to attend uh, a birthday party for one of my friends who was not Latino or Hispanic, and uh, lo and behold, they would have piñatas. Does everyone know what a piñata is, I hope? Yeah? So, excellent. So, yeah, so there would be, you know, a bunch of us, um, not all Hispanic, just beating the hell out of this piñata <laughs> with the promise of the payoff of a lot of candy that was stuffed in there, and of course having to contend with, invariably, some of the um, melted chocolate candy that came out because we were in Texas, after all. <laughs> so, um, all of that just to give a, a little bit of a, to, to frame things a little bit. Um, and I'd like to begin with just a brief look at uh, where we stand, and what I mean by we, of course, is the United States, um, with respect to racial and ethnic representation here. Uh, since the goal for, for these programs um, in, in, on one level uh, has been to accurately mirror the communities that we serve. This is a very lofty goal. I'm not certain that we're ever going to get there as a profession, but it's certainly worth pursuing. Uh, I'm certain many of you are aware of these uh, demographic statistics that are 
presented here uh, and probably where we're headed, again, as a nation uh, in the U.S., but uh, I don't know, I would venture to say that perhaps our neighbors to the north are probably uh, headed to uh, a similar um, a makeup. Um, of course, I'm also certain that many of you uh, might uh, be aware of the fact that um, those who identify as Hispanic or Latino, and I'm not just saying that because I'm one of those, uh, but that we are by far the fastest growing minority group in the US. But it's also interesting to note that uh, the one other quickly growing, uh, the burgeoning population uh, is, in fact, can, can uh, well, I'll just tell you, it's those those who identify as mixed racial are multiracial. It's a very quickly growing demographic. Um, so I think it's going to have some interesting implications just all around, but we're quite aware of that. If you were wondering with where we are with respect to racial and ethnic uh, representation in institutions of higher learning, uh, those statistics, uh, that pie chart looks remarkably similar to that of the general population right now, or at least it did in 2009. Of course, here the one difference um, in here, and I don't mean to dwell on you know the, the Latino population, but the Hispanic population here is about half of what it is in the general population due in large part to the fact that it is a much younger demographic, and again, the implications for institutions of higher learning in eight to ten years, um, I think, are immense. Um, so in case you're not aware of where we are as a community, and again, these are uh, reports from U.S. Uh, ARLs, this is what we look like. We stand at about 14.2 representation um, as of the 2010-2011 salary survey. Uh, those, uh, that, that percent, the 14.2, is actually better, uh, a higher percentage than ALA, than the Society of American Archivists, than the Medical Library Association, uh, or ACRL with uh, the, uh, the, the one admission here that, of course, the methodologies for reporting uh, those data are a bit different for those institutions, uh, associations. They self-report, and we tend to gather that, uh, those data. I might also point out uh, that it, it, we have been more effective as of late of recruiting those of Asian descent into our programs and uh, into professional jobs in our organizations. Uh, this is something that I am actively addressing uh, with respect to outreach efforts to African Americans, to the the Hispanic and Latino community, and of course those from Native or Indigenous communities. So just a little bit of history about all of this and uh, all of our programs, our diversity programs specifically, and Nancy uh, mentioned a few things about this. Um, this uh, these efforts came out of, again, that need to mirror the, uh, the communities that we are serving. Uh, it is connected to our st strategic plan, uh, specifically more related to the Transforming Research Library roles agenda and portfolio, where uh, it calls for ARL to develop a diverse and growing body of professionals prepared and developed to to take on new roles and work in new modes. So ARL uh, claims to articulate, promote, facilitate, uh, and um, the expanding roles for ARL libraries that support, enable, and enrich transformations that are affecting research and research intensive education. So embedded in ARL's guiding principles are the goals of encouraging and supporting members as they strive, as I've said, to reflect society's diversity in their staffing, in their collections, in their leadership, and in their programs. Increasing representation of uh, racial and ethnic minorities in member libraries has been a goal of these programs, as Nancy said, since their inception in the early 1990s. And efforts became more formalized uh, with uh, grant funding that was secured a bit later. And the work of diversity centered around collections and workplace climate at that time was woven into the operations of OMLS, although I think back then it was called OMS, I think. Um, the landscape of ARL libraries was not uh, terribly different than it is today, but it was at about 10.6% uh, representation of those targeted um, groups in member libraries. So, a little bit more history. In 1999, a formal pitch was made to the board by my predecessor a couple of folks ago, Dieta Jones, and by the then chair of the ARL Diversity Committee, who lo and behold was Nancy Baker, <laughs> um, uh, to establish a member-funded diversity recruitment program. So the, prog uh, the proposal was accepted, and over the course of the next three years or so, 52 ARL member libraries stepped up 
and donated $10,000 each to establish a fund. So raised a bit over $500,000 in support of this diversity minority recruitment program that I'm guessing uh, did not have a name immediately or perhaps soon thereafter. Uh, the first of uh, three IMLS grants were awarded uh, in 2003, and I'll say a little bit more about that in just a little bit. So just this little historic um, view here. So it was the Leadership and Career Development Program that began in 1997. The Initiative to Recruit a Diverse Workforce was established with that fund in 2000. The Research Library Leadership Fellows Program, about which I'm really not going to say a great deal today, uh, but that first co cohort was established in 2004. We received another IMLS grant in 2008 in support of another minority recruitment program, the Career Enhancement Program. Program. And our last success was just last year when we uh, were awarded an IMLS grant in support of the ARL and the Music Library Association Diversity and Inclusion Initiative. I'll try to deconstruct what is, I guess, kind of a sort of alphabet soup of acronyms here for all of you as we go along. Um, I know even some of my committee members get a little bit confused with all of the, uh, <laughs> with everything, but uh, we'll try to explain that a little bit further as I go along. And just, uh, you know, for some general information, also under um, the uh, diversity and leadership portfolio, we have the ARL Career Resources website, we have a job announcements database, uh, a residency database, a student residency, uh, excuse me, a student resume database, uh, which some of your HR people avail themselves to on occasion uh, when they're in recruitment processes for particular positions. Uh, the leadership symposium, uh, uh, formerly called an institute, which was, um, are uh, normally just attached to ALA Midwinter, but it's a three-day leadership symposium, and uh, most of our diversity uh, programs participants uh, take advantage of that, but that uh, symposium is actually open to all MLIS students. Uh, the National Diversity and Libraries Conference, the last uh, event that we had was in 2010, and that was hosted by uh, Princeton University and Karen Trainer. Uh, we canceled that event uh, this year because of the Joint Conference of Librarians of Color conference that's actually being held in Kansas City in September. Um, and then also our diversity publications, which to date really only includes uh, a, an online, um, an online uh, newsletter that we have, but we are working uh, and we have a VPO in place who uh, is helping us uh, to develop uh, those areas further. So to dive into this a little bit um, more, um, and with respect to what we've been able to do with that initial investment and, and many subsequent uh, investments by IMLS, um, this is what we've been able to do. For the initiative to recruit a diverse workforce, we have been awarded over the course of years uh, $1.4 million in three IMLS grants awarded in 2003, 2006, and 2010. Um, we've supported or are currently supporting about 156 students to date, and a little over a third of them uh, are from STEM academic backgrounds. The 2006 grant uh, was focused on recruitment of students with academic backgrounds in natural or applied sciences and also information technology or computer science. Uh, but at that time, we were having a bit of difficulty recruiting students with that academic profile into the program. So a decision was made by the then diversity working group. Boy, you've called this just about everything, haven't you, Nancy? Yeah. So the diversity working group uh, made a decision to tap into the, those funds, the $520,000 fund, to, to fund other students with academic backgrounds in the humanities, the social sciences, the fine arts, etc. And uh, I'll show a, a graph a little bit later to show you where those expenditures went. I think an important piece of, um, well, it's more than just anecdotal information, but if I can quote Marianne Gaunt, who has served on the selection committee for the initiative for, for quite a few iterations, is that um, the applicants for this program are getting increasingly more sophisticated as time goes by. Uh, last year, for example, uh, we had two PhDs in the program, one a PhD in material science from uh, MIT, another uh, a PhD in optics from Rochester. Uh, both of those folks are currently working in ARL libraries in spite of their rather shabby academic credentials. <laughs> um, this year we have two JDs in the program, uh, both of them with undergraduate degrees in natural sciences, uh, just as an example. And I do have to take just a, a, a little bit of a 
uh, of a diversion here um, to say that I think one of the things that makes the initiative to recruit a diverse workforce a truly unique experience is the annual uh, visit to the Purdue University libraries that is uh, completely underwritten, completely funded by Jim Mullins and the good folks at Purdue. Um, and uh, we'll speak a little bit later to uh, some of the, the, uh, the outcomes for, for that. Um, and it's, it's truly a remarkable experience. So where are they now? Past diversity scholars, this graph represents where they stand now, where we stand now with respect to the former participants uh, currently working uh, in various libraries. Uh, this is only an estimate, I have to tell you. Uh, these figures are based primarily on a survey uh, that was conducted in 2009 of all former diversity scholars. Uh, that was conducted by Alana. Uh, Alana Aiko Moore and myself, uh, Alana is at UC San Diego. Uh, we had about a 72% response rate in that, uh, the total population at about 126 then. And also, it includes some data about uh, what I know now, what we know now with respect to placements since, since I came on board in 2009. I know you're all going to be very shocked to hear this, but um, our uh, survey instrument, our questionnaire was just a little bit flawed. Um, so um, you'll see there that there's that 8% uh, that identified as working in special law, health sciences, and corporate libraries, and it's highly likely that the 8% uh, represented there are also uh, many of them connected to ARL institutions. Um, Again, based on self-reporting and easily verifiable information about recent placements of initiative scholars and, of course, our CEP fellows, and I'll talk about that program in a little bit, um, it is, it, uh, I'm pretty certain that we have reached the halfway point in terms of the number of ARL institutions who have been able to recruit these good folks into their programs, uh, into professional positions. And that, by the way, does include a handful of Canadian institutions. Um, another way to look at this, uh, that I think is helpful is that um, the overall increase of minority hires in ARL libraries in the last 13 years, amongst them, there have been 314 minority hires since then, since that sur salary survey, and uh, over a fifth of them, uh, I think actually closer to a quarter of them by now, uh, have gone through our programs. And again, I think these estimates are somewhat conservative. So. You know, the 34.2% uh, who are working in other academic uh, institutions, certainly uh, we aim to do a better job about recruiting more of them into our organizations, ARL organizations. But uh, I think that 34.2% is still quite positive. It helps build the case with respect to IMLS, continued IMLS funding. Um, they are quite keen, uh, as you heard from Susan just a little while ago, uh, at funding projects that have a broad impact, reaching multiple constituencies, diverse audiences, Audiences and on a national scale, and I really think that just uh, bolsters our argument about the impact of the program on the academic library community at large. So we embarked upon a different, a slightly different approach in 2008 um, with the Career Enhancement Program, which is essentially a minority fellowship program, also again funded by a very generous IMLS grant when the threshold back then was still a million dollars, um, but and also funded by vol by contributions from eight partner ARL libraries. Uh, what happens for the uh, career in the Career Enhancement Program is that the partners host these MLIS students for paid summer internships at those institutions for periods of about six to 12 weeks. Um, in most instances, the CEP fellows relocate to the geographic area of the host partner institution, and they engage in project work that's been defined based on many conversations uh, between them and the program coordinators at the respective partner libraries. Uh, the partner libraries also create uh, other programs for the fellows in order to provide them with an inside look at the uh, operations of those organizations. Uh, frequently, they're in, uh, invited to attend attend committee meetings and participate in other programs that are designed specifically for them. Uh, the grant was written to support the participation of 45 students in the CEP, and I'm very delighted to report that upon the con conclusion of the grant in June of this year, we will have provided the experience to 61 students total, and that's largely because I'm really cheap. But um, here too, um, we have seen success with respect to placement, uh, actually a great deal of success with respect to placement in ARL libraries, uh, keeping in mind here that about 29% of the CEP fellows are still currently 
currently enrolled in MLIS programs, we've been able to place about a quarter of them, uh, 44, excuse me, 24.5% into positions in ARL libraries. So this program, the CEP, really represents a, a slightly different approach to minority recruitment for ARL. It's the uh, aggregate experience of the program in this iteration, including uh, um, support to attend the ARL Leadership Symposium, a formal mentor program, uh, tuition support, a paid internship, of course, in one of the eight ARL uh, partner libraries on this project. Uh, so many of the components of the initiative to recruit a diverse workforce, but with the added uh, benefit of that paid internship. So that's two of the three uh, diversity recruitment programs. I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was going through puberty. <laughs> I'll try not to squeak. Uh, I was telling Heather earlier, it wouldn't be, this would be much easier if I could sing it. Honestly, that's, that's true. I, that's just. So the Leadership and Career Development Program, uh, the goal of this program uh, is to uh, prepare and develop mid-career librarians from traditionally underrepresented groups to take on, uh, to take on leadership roles in academic and research libraries. Uh, this program was created out of uh, uh, an expressed concern from ARL, ARL directors some years ago about the low numbers of minorities in leadership positions in our institutions. Uh, since its inception in 1997, 111 libraries Libraries have been supported through this fellowship, uh, and that does not include, by the way, uh, the current uh, class of 18 who will be graduating graduating uh, in June of this year. So the design and the curriculum of the program have really changed a great deal over the course of the years with uh, a current emphasis on the ARL strategic directions. The only comprehensive study of past uh, form uh, past LCDP fellows was completed in 2008 by Teresa Neely from the University of New Mexico. Uh, Teresa published an article in the Journal of Library Administration, um, and in her study, she um, reported that 40% of former LCDP fellows uh, reported career advancements that they attributed uh, directly to their involvement and training in the LCDP. Um, five, at that time, had moved up to director positions, but in non-member libraries. I think it's certainly time to take a hard look at this program again and develop a, a methodology uh, that will gather the type of data that we need um, to see where we're going with this program, but we are certainly seeing anecdotal evidence of our progress. Uh, we have Denise Stevens, who's here, uh, the first of our LCDP graduates to actually take on a leadership role, um, maybe twice, I think, in, a, in an ARL member library. Uh, we have a growing contingent of AULs, uh, small but growing contingent of AULs who are participating in the RLLF, which I think is positive. I will also say about our current class of LCDP fellows uh, slated to graduate in June that we have had five already who have moved up into leadership positions, management positions, uh, four within their own institutions and one uh, who has actually uh, gone on to a different institution. So uh, I think that's quite telling. Um, regarding the, uh, the benefit from the fellows' perspective, um, our uh, I think, as we've seen with our extensive review of the RLLF program, it's really the qualitative data that tells much more about the value of this program for the participants. Uh, from the fellow's perspective, uh, they express uh, that they um, have increased self-awareness of leadership styles and behaviors, uh, as well as self-confidence, renewed self-confidence or developed self-confidence to pursue leadership roles. Uh, they experience greater awareness of the strategic issues and Trends of research libraries and institutions, uh, an increased awareness of the importance of scholarly output and the value that that brings to leadership, the networking opportunities provided through the program with uh, luminaries in the profession, with high-level uh, high level campus administrators, uh, with ARL directors, uh, many of whom serve as career coaches for the program, and then of course the relationships, the significant relationships and friendships that come out of the experience and the support networks that are developed. And again, similar, similar to the RLLF, the directors who have supported their staff through this program see a payoff uh, and, uh, with the increased knowledge on the part of their fellows about pressing strategic issues on their campuses and in their libraries, and of course the increased confidence uh, for leading initiatives and or uh, leading important dialogues on these issues. 
So the last program that I'll review very quickly for you is um, the um, most recent program that was developed, uh, a collaborative project with the mus between ARL and the Music Library Association. So with respect to minority representation in MLA, uh, MLA is in fact the least diverse professional organization in the LIS field uh, that is compared with all of those organizations that I uh, mentioned previously. Um, certainly that there is, there is an advantage of me having come out of that community and having connections with the association and of course having some expertise with respect to the field. But most importantly, if you're wondering, well, why MLA? Um, I, the important thing to remember is that this program stands as an experiment in design more than anything else. What we're attempting to do with this program is to take the best elements that are part of the initiative to recruit a diverse workforce, uh, the most significant being the generous uh, tuition stipend funding, and then um, the, the practical work experience that's offered through the Career Enhancement Program, through the CEP, and kind of combine them into a singular recruitment program, really in the attempt to come up with, I guess, a best practice, a most effective strategy um, for diversity recruitment. Um, of course, the other innovative part about this is that it is uh, in partnership with an, an, a library association that operates on a national and international scale. So the jury is still out on this uh, project. Um, we've just started. Uh, we're just getting our musical ducks in a row. Um, so we're just launching. Uh, and in case you're wondering about employment prospects uh, for uh, the 15 students that we propose to recruit, um, as part of this program, uh, there have been in the last three months anywhere between five to seven music and performing arts positions available in the last um, the last three months or so in ARL libraries. So uh, I'd also might mention that I think that there's a growing contingent of former music librarians that are actually ARL directors. I think we need a formal We'll study about that. And this represents the pie chart, chart uh, reflects the 2009 demographic of the Music Library Association. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm a little bit out of. So, <laughs> sorry. So with respect to the, um, the benefits of these programs, the program outcomes, I mean, obviously, beyond the improved uh, demographic representation that we have, there are so many benefits to participants, benefits for the institutions that are involved in these projects, and benefits to ARL. I mean, naturally, we've already discussed the issue, awareness uh, for our minority recruitment programs. Uh, that training comes largely through the Leadership Symposium, and then also through the Purdue Library visit uh, that I mentioned a little bit earlier those opportunities to view the operations and expectations uh, for um, well for securing jobs in ARL libraries and then also for being uh, retained and perhaps for advancing once they get there. Uh, for program participants, uh, this uh, change perception of the employment opportunities and roles that they might engage in in ARL libraries. And of course, especially for the CEP fellows and we hope for the MLA uh, uh, participants, the uh, gaining of practical experience and skills development. Uh, again, the development of a community, a community of people who support one another, who share um, information about opportunities for professional advancement, for funding, uh, publication, and, uh, and these sorts of opportunities uh, amongst the cohorts of diversity scholars and CEP fellows. As far as benefits for the institutions, um, it has been expressed by a couple of our CEP uh, uh, partners that uh, they're really their organizations have so little diversity that in fact the CEP fellows when they're on campus for six to 12 weeks, that is the only exposure that those organizations have to much diversity, to any diversity. Um, naturally, the CEP fellows contribute a great deal to projects on those campuses, be it in archival processing, uh, be it in research that's in support of um, other uh, projects being developed and that sort of thing. Um, many people who are engaged with our CEP fellows and our initiative scholars uh, express uh, very frequently express a sense of professional renewal as they uh, engage with our scholars and, and CEP fellows as either mentors, as supervisors at those host institutions and that sort of thing. And then also just the, um, the exposure to a, a new and energetic uh, crop of MLIS professionals and, uh, and the, the various skills that they bring, not only the professional skills, but their social networking skills uh, and this sort of thing. So there are many benefits. <clears throat> with respect to the benefits of it to ARL, 
Again, it's what we signal to the collective uh, regarding our commitment to these efforts and to make our uh, profession more diverse. And then also, again, the uh, persistent engagement with a new LIS workforce. So looking ahead, why should these programs continue? Why should our, um, these programs continue to be developed, whatever they look like in the future? Well, because the population trends that served as an impetus for these initiatives continue and in fact are intensifying, I'm certain you're all aware of estimates of the U.S. Census Bureau, uh, again with my apologies to our, uh, our Canadian colleagues, that predict that minority groups will comprise slightly less than 50% of the total U.S. population by 2050. In fact, the NCES, NCES predicts that by 2020, 44% of enrollment in institutions of higher education will be from underrepresented groups. I have a feeling that this is likely to happen a lot sooner. And I cite these statistics perhaps with just a little bit of irony because I've long advocated for looking mere beyond, uh, beyond mere representation, excuse me, as justification for continuing these programs. I mean, if we look at the work of the folks that the folks are doing in Climate Qual at ARL, uh, with their protocol and the correlations that are being drawn between institutional commitment to principles of diversity and inclusion and customer satisfaction levels, I think we find a great justification. Um, in my stump speeches, as I go throughout the country, oops, excuse me, sorry about that, um, I frequently cite the work of Dr. Scott Page at the University of Michigan. Um, he is the author of a book entitled The Difference, um, How the Power of Diversity Creates Better Groups, Firms, Schools, and Societies. It's an excellent read. And he's done extensive research uh, on groups and their abilities to solve complex problems. And what he has found, that the more deep diversity that is represented Presented in the group, the more effective they are at problem solving. So notwithstanding the other successful programs like the uh, Spectrum Scholarship Program, um, there is simply no other program or group of programs that emphasizes and develops program participants around the issues that are unique to research libraries and uh, research institutions uh, that seeks to develop their skills and align those with the work that the modern research libraries are doing. So I encourage all of you to look at the agendas that are posted on our website, uh, agendas of the Leadership Symposium uh, that was held last January, and also the agenda of the Purdue Libraries visit, uh, a component of the initiative since 2005, because they serve as key examples of how the design and curricula of these programs are not quite like any other. So, pardon me. Okay. So lastly, and I think this is going to segue into a few things that may, Nancy might have to say, I just wanted to review not only the history of the programs, but the history of, of funding for, um, for these programs by ARL. As you can see here, I'm not going to dwell on this too much, uh, but there were uh, modest dues increases and portions of which were allocated to diversity in 1994 and 1998, and then again in 2000 with a small amount allocated to the LCDP. In the uh, 2005 strategic planning, uh, due support for diversity was reduced by 50% uh, um, at that time. This uh, represents the the um, uh, just a small portion of the expenditures from the five hundred and twenty thousand dollars that we collected in two thousand. So these reflect uh, these bars reflect expenditures in the various categories from about two thousand and eight until two thousand and eleven. Some of this is a little bit misleading because some of that does include uh, large amounts of money that were both collected that were passed through uh, for the National Diversity in, Li in Libraries Conference um, in two thousand and eight. Uh, so, but we're happy to uh, be happy to provide uh, additional information if anybody is interested. So, regarding uh, the future of the programs and the future funding, I don't want to step, I don't want to steal any of your thunder here, <laughs> Nancy, but we are going to be looking at uh, a, a multi-pronged approach at um, redeveloping uh, our resources for our efforts here, for diversity uh, efforts. Um, Nancy alerted you a little bit earlier today, and she's going to say a little bit more about uh, a fundraising plan that's being developed, a proposal that we're developing to solicit volunteer um, contributions from members libraries. Um, of course, we're going to continue to pursue uh, federal grants through IMLS, through NSF, 
through anybody who is willing to throw money our way. <laughs> um, and uh, and yeah, we'll just explore uh, any opportunities through any funding agencies that we can. We hope to build our fundraising capacity internally by searching for opportunities through other uh, funding agencies, through other through foundations, perhaps through corporate grants, and also perhaps through building strategic partnerships with others who are committed to this work. But again, with the understanding that no one quite does it uh, or has done it in the way that we've chosen to do it, uh, with the focus on academic and research librarianship, and with the focus on all of those developmental components uh, that have led, I think, to a great deal of success for diversity programs. Uh, I just want to say first that when, when we did this 12 years ago, I have to honestly confess I never thought this money would last this long. Um, uh, uh, we've leveraged this money incredibly well. And as I was listening to our lunch speaker, all I could think of was when, when she said, I know we haven't funded many of your programs, and I thought um, perhaps not in terms of dollar amount, but in terms of the actual success of these programs. I mean, uh, we could not have done all of this without IMLS. And uh, Knowing that we're going into a period where nobody quite knows what the story is going to be in terms of uh, funding, that always makes me a little bit nervous. But we're at, we're at a point where obviously we're going to have to do something else, and the committee um, has uh, been putting together some kind of a, pro a proposal uh, that we uh, ran by the board and that we're going to be um, tweaking a little more uh, before it comes out to all of you. But we're going to be looking for just some, uh, a funding mechanism, as, as uh, Mark indicates. Uh, because I think these programs have been really more successful even than some of us thought they would be. And I think it's particularly noteworthy that um, we started this with, uh, for all practical purposes, with the programs itself, with, with Dieta Jones, who's... I can see you, <laughs> and um, Dieta Jones Young, and and also uh, it, we, with Jerome, and now with Mark, and we've been each one of them's been able to just kind of pick up the ball and carry it on um, uh, over the course of these twelve years. So I think that even speaks more to being able to have it leverage that money so well. So if if you have any questions, I'd be able to answer. We wanted to do this program because we pulled this information together. I thought I think it's pretty impressive actually how the these programs have developed and what's been coming from them. If you, of course, talk to anybody that's in the programs, um, you know they'll tell you um, how good they think they've been. But we're going to have to uh, begin to look for a new, uh, another, another way to keep this going. And I just want to also add, I got a little discombobulated, my notes got out of order, but uh, one of the points that, that I was going to make was that we have we have raised between the three IMLS grants in support of the initiative to recruit a diverse workforce, the one for the CEP, and we did reapply in December 15th for a second iteration of the CEP, fingers crossed that it'll get uh, funded. There was also another uh, recruitment program called the ARL Academy, for which it was not a diversity uh, program, but it was a recruitment program for which uh, uh, ARL was awarded a grant in, nine, uh, in the, about nine hundred thousand dollars. So over the last, the course of the thirteen years, we've been able to raise almost three point five million dollars. And but it's all been federal funds. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, we need to, to rethink that strategy, which of course uh, always makes me a little nervous, um, particularly these days. But on the other hand, uh, if, if you're like me in a state agency each year, you, you sort of wonder if this is going to be the year you know that really clamps down and being by nature an optimist, I you know you keep going along. Thank you for listening. Music was provided by Josh Woodward. For more talks from this meeting, please visit www.arl.org.